For over 40 years, a man-made object has been sitting on the surface of another world, dissolving in silence. It is the final corpse in a graveyard of machines that the Soviet Union sacrificed to explore the most dangerous place in our solar system. Since that last transmission flickered out in the 1980s, humanity has never returned to the surface. We have sent rovers to roam Mars for decades, yet we abandoned our closest neighbor entirely. The reason isn't just because it's difficult, it's because of what the Soviets found when they finally cracked the code. It is a story of crushing pressure, melting lead, and a planet that systematically destroyed everything we threw at it. This is the history of the only nation stubborn enough to land on Venus, and the terrifying reality they uncovered that frightened us away for good. To understand why we left, you have to understand the seduction. Before the space race really heated up, astronomers weren't looking at Mars as the ultimate prize. They were looking at Venus. Through a telescope, Mars is obviously a dead, frozen rock. But Venus? Venus was a mystery. It was hidden behind a perfect, unbroken sphere of bright white clouds. We knew it was almost the exact same size as Earth. We knew it had an atmosphere, and because it was closer to the sun, we assumed it was warmer. In the early 20th century, the prevailing theory wasn't that Venus was a hellscape. It was that Venus was a prehistoric paradise. The scientific community genuinely believed that beneath those clouds lay a lush, tropical swamp perhaps teeming with alien oceans and exotic life, protected from the cold vacuum of space. It was the ultimate lure. The Soviets didn't just want to go there for science. They wanted to claim the first landing on Earth's twin sister, but the planet was a trap. The campaign began in 1961. The Soviet space program was riding high on the success of Sputnik and Yuri Gagarin, they turned their sights to Venus with the confidence of a superpower. They launched Venera 1 and Venera 2. These weren't just probes, they were brute force attempts to strike the planet. But space travel in the 1960s was essentially ballistics with a radio attached. The engineers launched these metal canisters knowing that the failure rate was astronomically high. And they were right. Both probes died in the dark vacuum before they ever reached their target. Systems failed. Radios went silent. It was an inauspicious start, but it was just the beginning of the body count. While the Soviets were regrouping, the Americans managed a flyby. NASA's Mariner 2 swept past Venus in 1962. Not to land, but just to look. And in just 42 minutes of scanning, it shattered the tropical paradise dream. The data revealed that those clouds weren't hiding a rainforest. They were trapping heat in a runaway greenhouse effect that had spiraled into madness. The reading suggested surface temperatures were double the boiling point of water. NASA looked at the data, saw a planet that was essentially a pressurized oven, and effectively said, no thanks. They turned their attention to the moon and Mars. But the Soviets? They saw the Americans quitting as an opening. They weren't deterred by the impossibility of the environment. They became obsessed with it. They realized that if the U.S. wasn't going to play, the surface of Venus was theirs for the taking. The next phase of the Venera program wasn't exploration. It was a bombardment. Between 1966 and 1969, the Soviets launched probe after probe, Venera 3, 4, 5, and 6, hurling them into the atmosphere. Venera 3 became the first human object to crash land on another planet, though it died before it could tell us anything. But Venera 4? Venera 4 changed everything. It dropped into the clouds and deployed its parachute. For the first time, we heard the atmosphere of another world. As it descended, the data transmitted back painted a picture of a deceitful planet. High up in the atmosphere, the temperature and pressure were remarkably Earth-like. It was almost hospitable. But as the the probe sank lower, the trap snapped shut. The temperature didn't just rise, it spiked. The atmospheric pressure began to crush the hull. The air on Venus isn't like air on Earth. It is thick, heavy, and suffocating. Venera 4 was built to withstand severe pressure, but it wasn't enough. The atmosphere crushed the probe like an empty beer can while it was still falling. It never even saw the ground. The same fate befell Venera 5 and 6. They were strangled by the air before they could reach the surface. By 1970, the space race had shifted. The Americans had walked on the moon. The Soviets had lost the race for the lunar surface. To save face, to prove their engineering dominance, they had to conquer Venus. They had to 
to touch the ground and survive. So they stopped building scientific instruments and started building tanks. Venera 7 was ugly, heavy, and built for war. The engineers redesigned the descent module as a solid titanium sphere. They chilled it down before launch to buy it a few extra minutes of life before the heat soaked through. They abandoned the idea of a long, slow scientific descent. The goal now was simple. Fall fast, hit the ground, and survive long enough to send a signal. When Venera 7 arrived, its parachute ripped almost immediately. It plummeted through the clouds and slammed into the surface at 60 kilometers an hour. It should have been destroyed. But then a signal cut through the static. For 23 minutes, Venera 7 broadcast from the surface. It was the first time humanity had received a signal from the ground of another planet. And the news was apocalyptic. The temperature was 475 degrees Celsius, nearly 900 degrees Fahrenheit. The pressure was 90 times that of Earth. Standing on Venus would feel like being a kilometer deep under the ocean, while simultaneously being inside a pizza oven. Most nations would have declared victory and stopped. The environment was clearly impossible. But the Soviets wanted more. They didn't just want data. They wanted to see it. They wanted a photograph. This ambition led to the pinnacle of the program, the heavy landers of the mid-1970s. Venera 9 and 10 were five-ton behemoths. They were redesigned to handle the soup-like atmosphere. In fact, the air was so thick that they didn't even need huge parachutes for the final descent. They used a rigid metal disc, an air break to slow them down. They were essentially submarines designed to fall through the sky. In October 1975, Venera 9 touched down. The lens cap popped off, and for the first time in history, we looked at Venus. The image was black and white, warped by the camera lens, but it was undeniable. We saw sharp, jagged rocks. We saw a landscape that wasn't eroded by water, but baked by heat. It was a still dead world. There was no movement, no wind that could move the rocks, just a crushing, silent heat. A few days later, Venera 10 landed and sent back images of smooth, flat plains, ancient lava flows that had solidified eons ago. But the Soviets weren't done. They wanted color. They wanted to hear the wind. In 1982, Venera 13 pulled off the impossible. It survived for 127 minutes, over two hours in hell. It sent back color panoramas showing a yellow-orange sky, filtering light down onto orange-tinted rocks. The soil was analyzed and found to be volcanic basalt. But the most haunting part of Venera 13 wasn't the pictures. It was the audio. The lander carried a microphone. For the first time, we could listen to an alien world. The recording is filled with the static crunch of the wind, a low, heavy rumble of thick air moving across the metal skin of a dying robot. It is a lonely, desolate sound. After Venera 14, the mission stopped. The Soviet Union was crumbling. The money dried up. The political will vanished and the reality of Venus set in. We realize that Venus is a dead end. We can't colonize it. We can't terraform it with current technology. We can't even keep a robot alive there for an afternoon. Mars offers us a future. It has ice. It has dirt we can work with. It has a climate we can protect ourselves against. Venus offers only immediate destruction. And so we stopped going. The final Soviet landers are still there today. They have likely been crushed flat, melted down into unrecognizable pools of titanium and steel, becoming part of the planet they tried to conquer, they stand as a monument to a specific time in history when we were so desperate to be first that we threw ourselves into the fire just to say we did it. We unlocked the mystery of the clouds, and in doing so, we found a world that serves as a grim reflection of Earth gone wrong. A greenhouse, warning, waiting next door. Venus won the war. It kept its secrets for billions of years, and after a brief moment of prying them open, we retreated. But there is a lingering question. As our technology advances, as our materials get stronger, will we ever go back? Or is the fear of that crushing orange twilight enough to keep us away forever? If you want to join us as we uncover more lost chapters of space history and the dark realities of our universe, make sure you hit that subscribe button. There are plenty more mysteries out there and we're going to find them all.